Tonight, we are drinking Las Vegas Lager with cucumber and lime from Big Dogs Micro Brewing in Las Vegas, Nevada. Garage grade, three and a half bottle caps out of five. What happens in Vegas shouldn't have to stay in Vegas, not when it's this good. And we're staying refreshed tonight because of some of our good garage friends. First up, we have Corey in Claremont, Florida. And to KM, we like your jib. Next, let's go out west and thank Karen in Santa Monica, California. Staying in California, we have Cammie and Jessica in San Diego. Stay classy. Mm, mm, that's pungent. And right around the corner from me in Hilliard, Ohio, we have Nicolina. Here's a cute message. It says, greetings, chaps, from across the pond in the black country. Enjoy a round of beers on me. That's from Deborah. In Olympia, Washington, we have Colin. Big cheers to you, mate. We also have Brendan and Lindsay in Bellingham, Washington. And we have priests in Singapore. And sending hugs from Bergen, Norway, we have Siren. And our last birthday shout out ever, so we can stop sounding like Morning Zoo Radio. All right goes to Emily from Laurel in Minnesota. So thank you to everybody in our big garage family. We thank you. We appreciate you. For everything True Crime Garage, go to truecrimegarage.com. And if you'd like to follow us on social media, Snapchat, Twitter, Instagram, Untap, do so at True Crime Garage. And that's enough of the business. All right, everybody gather around, grab a chair, grab a beer. Let's talk some true crime. September 7th, 1996, Las Vegas, Nevada. This was supposed to be a big day in sports. A lot of Mm -hmm. people, a lot of celebrities, they had made their way to Vegas to see the big boxing match. This is Bruce Seldon versus Mike Tyson billed as the championship part two. Mm -hmm. Bruce Seldon was the WBA heavyweight champion. He had a record of 33 and three. And Iron Mike Tyson, just three fights removed from his time in prison, Won all three fights in his previous fight. He had just captured the WBC heavyweight title. Tyson's record, a very impressive 44-1. and one. Of course, the big fight was broadcast live on pay-per-view, and the fight was held at the MGM Grand in beautiful Las Vegas. And I can't remember if I actually watched this fight, but any child of the 90s, um, you would know your, your father would get the Tyson fights, and they'd last about like a minute, mm-hmm. and then your father would be yelling, because they, they paid all this money to watch a, a minute-long fight. Well, unfortunately, the big fight was really a much to do about nothing because Tyson mopped the floor with the guy. Right. Tyson knocked Selden down twice, both times connecting with a powerful left hook. And Tyson won by way of knockout in the first round in just 1 minute 49 seconds, making it one of the shortest championship fights in boxing history. In attendance that night, as we said were plenty of celebrities. You know, Vegas is only about an hour and a half long flight from Los Angeles. Mm, Yeah, four four hour, five hour drive from LA as well. So of course we have Tupac Shakur was present and he was there with Death Row Records CEO, Suge Knight, Mm -hmm. and their entourage of friends, family, and business associates. Well, after the fight, this is sometime between 8.30 and 9 p.m., someone in Tupac Suge Knight's entourage A guy by the name of Trayvon, he spots this dude, Orlando Anderson, nicknamed Baby Lane. Mm -hmm. Uh, We'll just call him Orlando. But Orlando is 21 years old, and he's a member of the, I believe it's a member of the Southside Crips. Well, this is no good because they had beef. Mm -hmm. Apparently, Orlando and some of his Crip buddies had robbed someone in the Foot Locker store earlier that year. Uh, it sounds like this person who was robbed was was with Tupac and Suge in Vegas that night. Right. So that guy, uh, Trayvon, he points out to Orla- he points out Orlando to Suge and Pac. And this is not going to end too well for Orlando. No, no, this is going to end about as good for Orlando as it does for Selden in the boxing match. Tupac led the attack. He ran up and he hit Orlando. Uh, Suge and the rest joined in. They took Orlando to the ground pretty quickly, mm-hmm. uh, kicking him while he was down. Uh, Tupac in the death row guys, uh, they had their own security with them there that night. Well, and you can, if you YouTube this, you can actually find the fight online. 
uh, n- not the actual Tyson fight, but the fight afterwards with Tupac. You can find that on YouTube. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it was caught on surveillance camera that night. Well, one of the private security uh, for the death row guys, he pretty quickly pulled Tupac from the fight. And right. if you if you watch the surveillance footage, this all happens very quickly. You can kind of see Pac run up and appear to hit the guy. And then you see this like just this crowd of, I'm guessing, entourage people that, that follow in very quickly behind. And I'm just going to throw this out there because I've, I've seen this multiple times as far as conspiracy theories go. A lot of people think that it's actually not Tupac in the video, that the size and the build of Tupac is disproportionate to actually what Tupac was. Um, I think as, as far as like the police reports of this incident and the security reports that happen, it's pretty clear that Tupac was there. Also, there is some speculation that he was wearing a bulletproof vest at the time mm-hmm. as Tupac was known to wear a bulletproof vest multiple times. There's also a rumor that uh, Suge Knight, that's, now I can't find this myself, I've looked over and over, but there's somewhere in the video footage where Suge Knight is actually trying to get Tupac to take off his vest. I, now, again, that's just rumors that I've heard. I can't back that up. Uh, by by me actually watching the video myself. Mm-hmm. Well, after after this scuffle takes place um, around nine p.m., everyone in the group, mm-hmm. uh, they in Tupac's group, they kind of head their separate ways. They all go to their hotel rooms. They're going to get cleaned up, you know, change clothes, and get ready to go out for the night. The plan being that they're going to a club. Well, right, and and I think the thing is. And I'm not very for sure about this because they say that Tupac was supposed to make an appearance. Mm-hmm. Now, I don't know if that was a, if he was supposed to perform or just show up because sometimes these celebrities or these rappers would get paid to go to an after party. Yeah. And, you, and you're right about that. I had heard, I had heard it both ways. Um, but the, the way that I've heard it the most is that he was to perform that evening. Okay. Um, yeah. And then some of that stuff too is it's just like a birthday party like a celebrity kid's birthday party or something. You want to talk about easy money. Sometimes they're paid six figures to show up and do one tune. Mm-hmm. Well, and the thought could be captain that that his appearance or his performance that night at the six, six, two club might fund the entire trip for all those guys to go out there, you know, mm-hmm. and, and it's good publicity for him uh, to sell records as well. And, and let's go back a little bit because Tupac is there with Suge Knight but didn't travel with him. He's traveling with his cousin, um, and he's traveling with his girlfriend at the time, which it, was uh, Quincy Jones's daughter. And I can't recall his cousin's name, but it's it's a female cousin. Yeah. Um. They, so they shared like a birthday month, and so he's like, "Hey, come to Vegas, and and let's party." But before this all went down, uh, there was a lot of speculation and rumors from. Tupac's family that he, for some reason, just wasn't feeling up to going to Vegas that weekend. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that points out something to me about Pac's character, because we, you know, as we showed yesterday, he did not have a great family structure, let's say. Mm -hmm. Um, He didn't have an easy time growing up, but I've seen plenty of videos and plenty of evidence that as an adult, as you know, once successful, that he always tried to, you know, do things with his family, keep his family together. And as you said, brought along the cousin on this trip. Well, this is when he goes back up to his room to get well, on to touch on that a little bit, what you were saying before. And a lot of Tupac's interviews, he would talk and and I have a lot of respect for him for this because his whole thing was, yeah, I'm becoming famous and yeah, I'm getting a bunch of money, but I don't need a, a ton of stuff. I'm going to I'm going to support my family. Mm-hmm. And I'm going to, no matter how much money that costs to to help them out, I'm going to help them out. Well, and as we mentioned, the cousin is along on this trip. And when when Tupac goes up to his room to get cleaned up for the evening, change of clothes, uh, he, you know, and this is her words. She says, you know, he he was he was on like cloud nine when he came up to the room. He he was excited because he 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 loved watching the boxing match. Right. Uh, he was probably pretty jacked up from that. And then that might have been why he ran up and it wasn't so hard to get Tupac to run up and punch this guy. Right. Um, and so he was kind of pumped up and bragging to her a little bit about uh, the fight that he had had in the in the lobby, comparing himself to Mike Tyson. And um, she says that when he. <laughs> right, right. 
uh, when, you're not as big as Mike Tyson, but <laughs> when he goes up there to change his clothes, you know, it was it was regular Tupac, Mr. Happy Go Lucky. And she didn't see anything that would put off any any warnings to her. Now, one thing that she did think was strange was he left the room without his bulletproof vest. Right now, um, when once he gets downstairs, a bodyguard suggests to Pac that he should wear the vest that night. And Pac says, nah, it's going to be, it's going to be too hot here tonight. Right. Um, so they're going to club six, six, two. Um, I have in my notes that Pac was performing there, but as we said, it could have just been an appearance. Now the group, before they make it to the club, they go to Suge Knight's mansion. He has a mansion in the area and they're there for about a half an hour or so. And during the course of this visit, Pac and Suge, they're off in what I'm going to call it a secret meeting, but no, nobody in the group titles it as that. Right. They just said that for a, for a portion of that time at Suge's, Suge's house, the two of them were off somewhere. They didn't know why they weren't with the group or what they were discussing or what was going on. When they go to leave Suge's mansion, uh, Pac's bodyguard, this is Frank Alexander. He well, would, and to be fair, I mean, this is his label. Right, so it could have just been, hey, something came up. We need to discuss this real quick mm -hmm. in private. Yeah, it, it may not have been anything of great importance of things that were going to happen that evening. Right. Um, the bodyguard, Frank Alexander, he says that he would typically ride with Tupac in the vehicle, and he was prepared. He said he was standing at the car with the back door open, getting ready to ride in the back seat with Suge Knight and Tupac, on their way to the club that evening. He says in this statement, uh, in, in this particular documentary that I was watching, that Pac had suggested to him that he should take another car, that he should drive in another car because they'll probably have extra people, additional people coming back from the club to the hotel afterwards, and they may need additional vehicles. Right. Now, we've also heard statements that Pac told him to ride in the vehicle with his then fiance or girlfriend at the time. The yeah. prob the problem I have with the, the and, Quin uh, and Quincy D Jones's daughter, right? And the reason why I'm kind of pointing this out is because people have put a lot of speculation on why the bodyguard would not be with Pac, and I think you should first of all, and, but second of all, the problem I have with it is that there's so many different statements. You know, is it possible that he rode with the girlfriend and additional guys in that in that car? Yes, it's possible. Right. But in his statement, he never mentions, Frank Alexander's statement, he never mentions the, the girlfriend at the time. The problem, though, being, I I believe that, that we've seen varying accounts from Mr. Frank Alexander. Uh, and, and I don't mean drastically varying accounts. I mean, mm -hmm. slightly varying accounts. So I'm just kind of covering our bases there, but so he's not going to ride with Pac. Now there's been other people that have suggested that Suge Knight told Pac to suggest to the bodyguard to ride in another vehicle. Right. But we have the bodyguards claims that it was Pac. So, mm -hmm. so we have basically a three car convoy and we have Suge Knight and Pac. They are in a 96 BMW 750 IL, which uh, I'm not a not a Suge backer, uh, but he's got good taste in cars. I got to tell you that it's a rental, though. Right around, around is it? <laughs> I don't know. For, hey, look, from all the statements after Pac dies, is that you know everything was leased anyways? It, it was own anything. I, I yes, I think we should be. I don't think it was. Well, actually, I should say I know it wasn't a rental. It could have been a lease. Regardless, um, around 11 p.m., they are stopped. This is uh, Tupac's car. Mm -hmm. They're stopped on the Las Vegas Boulevard. This is by Metro Bicycle Police. Uh, <laughs> Come on. Can you imagine being stopped by a, a cops on a bike? Well, there's a lot of people walking around down there. No, I understand that. But I'm just saying, you know, if you're walking and you get stopped by a cop on a bike, not a big deal. But if you're driving and a cop on a bike stops you, I'd be going, what are you doing? Well, apparently they're stopped for their stereo being too loud and there's no license plates on their vehicle. 
Mm-hmm. Um, these license plates, for whatever reasons, w- were not on the car. They're later found in the trunk of the car. Um, there's no ticket issued. Um, there, you know, they kind of leave without any, right. without any altercation at all. Um, but not long after that, this would take us to around about 11, 10, 11, 15 PM. Now we have to, we have to kind of picture this a, as we're talking about it because you know, this is audio. We can't show you any diagrams here, oh. but picture the three car convoy pulling up to the corner of Flamingo and Corval. Right. And it looks like it's five lanes at the intersection. Yeah. So you have you have a vehicle in front, which has got, you know, death row guys in it. And then in the middle vehicle, you have Suge Knight, who's driving, and you have Tupac Shakur, who's sitting shotgun. And then there's well, yeah. and then there's a vehicle behind them as well, mm-hmm. which contains more of their entourage. So as they pull up, as the captain said, this is a multi lane road. Um, the vehicles are driving uh, in this three car convoy, but they're they're straightforward. They're not side by side. It's one, two, three as they pull up. Now they have a there's there's a bit of you know there's a vehicle next to them that has some lovely ladies in it, and Suge Knight and Tupac exchange some words with these ladies, uh, inviting them to the club uh, for his performance. Well. A white four-door late model Cadillac with an unknown number of occupants pulled up to the sedan's right side. So we have the the girls in their vehicle are on the left side of Suge and Pac. Mm -hmm. And so this vehicle pulls up to the right of them. So if you can picture this, their car, Suge Knight's car, is basically boxed in on all four sides. Mm Mm-hmm. And so this vehicle pulls up to the right-hand side, uh, rolled down a window, and rapidly fired gunshots. Um, I've, I've heard that 14 shots were fired is the most common number given here. Um, this is fired at Suge and Tupac's vehicle. Tupac was hit four times, twice in the chest, once in the arm, and once in the thigh. One of the bullets went into Tupac's right lung. Knight was hit, Suge Knight was hit in the head uh, by a fragmentation or a piece of, uh, piece of a bullet or a piece of glass. It's a little unclear, um, right. and, and I got to say that it's unclear. Part of that is because of Suge Knight's own statements. If you, you don't have to look very hard where you can see him in an interview saying, I was hit with a bullet in the head, and, and it, I still got a bullet lodged in my head. That's, that's not accurate by anything that I could find it. It, mm-hmm. it actually is probably a blatant lie, right. but he he's hit with either a fragment of a bullet or some kind of glass that, that does some damage to his head and he's bleeding quite badly. And the white Cadillac is it's in the right hand turn lane and it's going to turn right onto Corville. Yeah. And the bodyguard, Frank Alexander, he says that one of the death row cars went after the white Cadillac. Mm -hmm. Uh, But he states that that nothing came of this. Suge's car pulls away. Now, Suge is still driving. He's driving erratically at this time. Mm -hmm. And the car itself is badly damaged because I think Suge hit a few things with the vehicle. And the car eventually breaks down. Now, this is not terribly far from the scene of the shooting. The first officer to arrive at the scene was a now-retired officer. His name is Chris Carroll. Suge is out of the vehicle at this point. Uh, the officer, Carol, he's trying to open the passenger door to get Pac out of the vehicle, mm-hmm. uh, but it's stuck or it's jammed. But for whatever reason, he can't seem to get the door open. Now, Suge keeps coming up behind the officer and running up behind him. And the officer is trying to gain control of this of this situation because he doesn't really know what's going on here. You know, he can see that, that Tupac is in bad shape. Uh, he sees Suge who is bleeding from the head and in his, his exact words were he's bleeding pretty badly. Right. Uh, the officer at this point, you know, he doesn't know if these two guys might've shot each other. Um, he's not really sure what's going on. So he's got to kind of protect himself, but try to offer some assistance to these guys at the same time. Right. So he keeps kind of pointing his gun at Suge and saying, dude, you gotta, 
you got right, you, right, right. you got to lay down. You got to back off. Well, in fairness, so I can get this door open. Well, in fairness to the cop, too. I mean, Shook is a pretty big guy. Well, that's funny that you say that because he. That's exactly what he states in his in his interview. You know, he said, "My first thought is I see this giant man," he, mm-hmm. and he says he's huge. This guy is huge. He's running around. I'm worried about him coming up behind me. The, and he goes, and the guy's bleeding from the head, but he seems all there. You know what I mean? Right, he seems, right. he knows what's going on. He's, he's with it, but he keeps saying, you know, I, I was shocked that this dude was even walking around. I think, I think the officer may have thought because of the amount of blood coming from Suge that he was shot much worse than what he was. Right. Anyway, he's trying to gain control of the situation. He can't get the vehicle door open. According to whoever you want to believe, the officer says he eventually gets the door open. Suge Knight says that he has to keep coming up and trying to help the officer because the officer couldn't figure out how to get the door open or take off the seatbelt. Well, we'd assume that maybe the door is jammed because of the shots. Or or from Suge hitting something with the vehicle. True, right. So there's there's plenty of reason for it to be jammed. According to the officer, he finally gets the door open. And he at this point... He, yeah, but is at this point, isn't this when uh, they open up the door and Tupac's body just kind of falls out? Yeah, if he kind of falls out of the vehicle and he's kind of like leaning up against the open door at this point. Yeah, but he's been hit four times, right? Mm-hmm. He said, you know, so he the officer says, I, I grabbed him with my left arm. He falls out into me and I've still got my gun in the other hand. Uh, he said, stating that Tupac is covered in blood. And he noticed that immediately noticed that the guy's got a ton of gold on and he's got, you know, a necklace and jewelry and a all lot of the rings that night. You can actually uh, Google search Tupac the night of the fight and you can see what he's wearing and you can see he had multiple rings on each finger. The officer says that all of the gold, all of the jewelry is covered in blood. Uh, and he says that the the other guy just keeps yelling you know uh and and Shug's still yelling now now Shug is yelling pac pac uh, and he just keeps yelling it over and over again and this is when the officer realizes who who he's encountered you know right. he wasn't aware that it was Tupac until now he's got him out of the vehicle he sees all the blood and now he's putting everything together now the officer is stating that Tupac is also trying to yell back at Suge Knight. Yeah, and the officer says that at some point, very quickly, Tupac goes from yelling back at Suge to trying to speak or struggling to speak. Uh, He's not being super cooperative with the officer, but he's probably in a whole lot of shock as well um, to the point where he he basically could not, he couldn't speak very much at all. You know, almost kind of like, you know, he's out of energy. He's, he's been taken down and well, yeah. And the yeah. off, well, the officer's trying to get some information from Pac because once he realizes how badly this guy's been, been shot and injured, you right. know, he wants to find out who shot him. Can you tell me right. any information at all? And he, he asked him that several times, who shot you, who shot you? Um, and he says at some point, Tupac looked at him and took a breath uh, to get some words out. And when Tupac opened up his mouth, the officer thought that he was actually going to tell him who shot him or, or offer some cooperation. Right. Uh, but then the words came out from Pac F you. And then after that, he started gurgling and kind of slipping out of consciousness. And at this point, the ambulance is going to show up. They're going to take Tupac to the hospital. Now, this, uh, this officer that talked to Tupac or tried to help Tupac was saying that he never spoke another word after the FU, and then there was also an officer that rode in the ambulance with Tupac, and he also questioned him as well, trying to get answers, because obviously they know somebody shot him. Mm-hmm. Well, and then once they get to the hospital, we have this situation where he has to be rushed immediately into surgery to try to save his life. So he's, you know, he's in surgery. He's heavily sedated. Um, This is, this is a strange thing here, Captain, a a very strange thing to me. Mm -hmm. It's possible that both stories are true. But yesterday we reported that when, when Pac was shot in New York, that his, somebody in his group had informed the police that, that somebody was coming back to the hospital to finish the job. And we stated that, 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 
was probably very likely because Tupac rushed out of the hospital. He left a lot earlier than the doctors wanted him to. Mm -hmm. Now, the same story is basically repeated verbatim here as well, where somebody in the group called the police and stated that somebody's going to come back to the hospital to finish the job. We need to get an officer here. Um, And they're told that they're understaffed. There's no officer available to guard the the hospital room or to guard Tupac. I don't know. But, well, the other problem I have with this, though, too, is that you have bodyguards that you're that you're paying Mm -hmm. their salary. So, you know, wouldn't these bodyguards be able to be at the at the hospital to protect Tupac? Yeah, it's it's just the reason why I question it. um, I don't question it in the sense that somebody's life was in danger. And there's, of course, immediate threat in both situations. I kind of question it because it's the exact same story two times in a row. I I just don't know that it, that one of those stories actually happened. Um, I believe it happened at least once. Mm -hmm. I I just think that the waters are a little murky and, and some of the stories may have bled into one another. So that's a poor choice of words, but may have carried over from one incident to the other. Well, and what I was saying before, um, to me, this is just all pretty sad. You know, I, I can't understand. Maybe Tupac didn't know who shot him, but I, he might not have even seen anything. Right. I mean, he was he was basically ambushed when you think about it. He was he was shot. It was a surprise attack. Well, not right, but I'm and I'm very well aware that me and you know me and Tupac grew up in way different circumstances. I'm just you know if somebody shot me and I knew, wouldn't you want to say? Uh, right. I, I understand it's a whole different uh, situation, but that's what's so sad to me is is that maybe uh, his fans or his family or all, anybody could have got some answers uh, if he was just willing to to talk, you mm-hmm. know, and and say the name. But again, like you said, maybe he didn't didn't say the name. Yeah, I, or, I or didn't know or didn't see anything. I have a feeling that I I don't think he he saw who did this. Um or he didn't didn't know them en- enough to be able to identify anybody. Um but once he's at the hospital, you know, we 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 all know the sad story from here. You know, he's he's placed on some different type of life support machines. Um, yeah. now, now to show you how tough this dude was, right. uh, you know, Tupac, w- you know, we talked about yesterday, he, he's shot several times in New York and he leaves the hospital against doctor's orders. Um, right. and you know, me, me, I break a leg. I'm down for six months. This guy, maybe six years. <laughs> yeah. This guy, he's just, he's right back at it. He's a real yeah. man. So this situation here, they, at some point they have to sedate him because He's trying to get out of bed. This guy is, is you know, just breaths away from lifelessness. And yet he's got the strength somehow to to get out of bed. Right. Um, unfortunately, on the afternoon of September 13th. Well, um, yeah. Well, but the, what's reported, and this is where kind of the conspiracy stuff kind of falls into play, is some, some of it's uh, reported that he goes into a coma and then he has to have more, more surgeries because... Uh, where the bullets hit and then that possibly they had to remove a lung. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then several days later, like you said, he, he is reported dead. Yeah. He passes away. Um, and it sounds like they were, the doctors were trying to revive him. Uh, but after quite some time, his, his mother, uh, made the decision and told the doctors to stop, uh, trying. He's pronounced dead at, uh, 4 3 PM on September 13th. Are you hiring? Do you know where to post your job to find the best candidates? Finding great talent can be tough. Thankfully, with ZipRecruiter, you can post your job to 100 plus job websites with just one click. Then their powerful technology efficiently matches the right people to your job better than anyone else. That's why ZipRecruiter is different. Unlike other job websites, ZipRecruiter doesn't depend on candidates finding you it finds them. In fact, over 80% of jobs posted on ZipRecruiter get a qualified candidate in just 24 hours. That's amazing. 
There's no juggling emails. There's no calls to your office. You simply screen, rate, and manage candidates all in one place with ZipRecruiter's easy-to-use dashboard. Find out today why ZipRecruiter has been used by businesses of all sizes to find the most qualified job candidates with immediate results. And right now, my listeners can post jobs on ZipRecruiter for free. That's right, for free. Just go to ZipRecruiter.com slash garage. That's ZipRecruiter.com slash garage. One more time to try it for free, go to ZipRecruiter.com slash garage. We all need to take better care of ourselves, and taking care of our mental health is no exception. That's why today's sponsor, Talkspace, the online therapy company, makes it easy to connect with experienced, licensed therapists handpicked just for you for as little as $32 a week. Using Talkspace, you can send your therapist text, audio, and video message whenever you want. You can even do a live video chat. If you want to vent about work or talk through something that's been on your mind, no problem. Your therapist is ready to help, and you can do so at any time. And Talkspace is not only convenient, but it's confidential and affordable. So to sign up or to learn more, go to Talkspace.com slash garage. And as a special offer for our listeners, you can use coupon code garage to get $30 off your first month and show your support for this podcast. That's code garage at Talkspace.com slash garage. I personally use Talkspace and I find it way more convenient. So check them out today. Talkspace.com. Use our promo code garage. Talkspace. Therapy for how we live today. HelloFresh.com. We are on a mission to save home cooking because it's just too good to go away. We want to make cooking more fun. So we focus on the whole experience, not just the final plate. We like to think of ourselves as a farm to box company because we want everyone to have access to fresh ingredients that inspire great meals, but we're not going to stop there. HelloFresh is a couch to kitchen company and no better way to stop those 5 p.m. excuses than being unstoppable in the kitchen. HelloFresh is proud to be a fork to feel good company too, because when you cook and eat delicious and healthy meals, you'll want to keep doing it again and again. HelloFresh currently offers customers a classic box, a veggie box, and a family box. Customers can order three to five different meals per week designed for two or four people. New recipes are created every week. I get the classic box. It's very easy. My cooking skills have gone up tremendously. I love the fact that it it all comes together. It's all packaged together. All the ingredients, everything you need. So you're not missing anything. You don't have to go to the grocery store for anything. I like to cook, but you know what? I was making the same stuff week after week, and cooking at home got awfully boring. Not anymore. Not with HelloFresh. Now I'm cooking again, and I'm loving it, and I'm making the best stuff I've ever made. If you'd like to check out the classic box or the veggie box or the family box, you need to go check out HelloFresh right now and use our promo code GARAGE30. When you use our promo code GARAGE30, you're going to get $30 off your first week of delivery. So visit HelloFresh.com and enter GARAGE30 when you subscribe. Again, you get $30 off your first week of deliveries when you visit HelloFresh.com and you enter our promo code GARAGE30 when you subscribe. HelloFresh.com. Check them out today. right we're back cheers mates cheers well let's talk about the investigation a little bit and this won't take us too long before we get to some of the other more widely talked about things in this in this case but in september of 1997 one year after tupac was killed the las vegas police uh made a statement this is sergeant kevin manning he told the review journal that's the local las vegas newspaper that Tupac slaying, they didn't believe it to be motivated by a gang war or arguments within the rap world. Um, it said, he says that it appears to them that the motivation would be some type of personal dispute more than anything. And two of the detectives that were on this case, I, I thought they made an interesting statement. They were saying, you know, yeah, the, you know, Tupac had a lot of opinions on police officers, but that had no weight or bearing on their commitment to solve this case mm-hmm. that, that when they signed up to be detectives, when they decide, when they decided to be police officers, they took an oath and, and everybody that they were working for 
uh, deserved to have closure, to deserve to have their case solved. Mm -hmm. They also said that they had a lot of theories, you know, a lot of theories as to what went down that night, who was responsible, but stating that they have no witnesses willing to cooperate or any direct evidence implicating any specific individual. Now, police at the time said that Tupac's associates knew who killed him. Um, right. But that, that would be definitely Suge Knight, which was in the car with him. Mm -hmm. But they the, unable to make a case, they state. Now, we also have some FBI documents that have come out over the years. In 2011, a highly redacted 359-page document was released on the agency's website. This is a common site to post records that are of the subject of several Freedom of Information Act requests. Mm -hmm. Now, within those documents, you'll see that the, that the FBI's information is slightly different uh, regarding this investigation as far as what we just heard from the Vegas police. But I also want to throw out there that within these FBI documents, they are actually talking about their investigation into both the death of Tupac and Biggie. So within these documents, it says that the FBI did spend a lot of time examining a link between uh, the two killings. Mm -hmm. They also spent a lot of time examining the link between some LAPD officers who might have been members of street gangs or who worked security for death row and the ties between the record label and the blood gang members. And one of the things that the FBI would talk about with the connection with the blood gang is that they actually thought possibly both shootings were connected to the Southside Crips or the Southside Compton Crips. Yeah, that they that the Crips may have masterminded both of the uh, the killings. Um, here's another strange thing in this whole case, though. There was another shooting. Uh, this took place in November, just two months after Tupac's death. Mm -hmm. um, this the victim here is 19 year old, and I I have to apologize, but I have no idea how to say this young man's name. I think it's Yafi Fuller. Fula, I Fula. believe, and he actually had uh, two names. Um, mm -hmm. The other name that he went by was Yaki Gaddafi. Um, but I apologize if we misspoke on those, but I think we got pretty close there, Captain. And we're Reg trying our best. Yeah. Regardless, this young man, he was, he was a backup singer in uh, Tupac's group, the outlaws. Um, he was shot in a, ha in a hallway of a housing project in orange, New Jersey. This was two months after Tupac's death, just 19 years old. Uh, he was part of Pac's entourage in Las Vegas and was a passenger in a car directly behind Tupac's car when when the artist was killed. Now, um, police say that Fula's murder was unrelated to Tupac's case, even though Fula was the only witness who told Metro investigators that night that he could possibly identify Pac's assailant. Mm -hmm. Fula was killed before police could question him further at length. And like we were talking about a little bit during the break, our detailed account of the night or the shooting or where the cars were and all that stuff, we probably didn't do a homeroom job of. But we're going to get back to a lot of that stuff when we go through the theories. Yes, and there's varying accounts of those, but as you'll see as we go through these different things, it's going to come. we're going to have to come back to it a couple of times. Um, so let's talk about some of the widely discussed theories about Tupac's death and who killed him. Well, and here's just a little um, warning. If you're just the facts man, if you're just the facts man, then you probably don't want to listen after this. You're just the first part of the show, man. Right. So, all right. So the, the first theory is that the Illuminati had something to do with the death of Tupac. Mm -hmm. um, you know, in 1996. Well, yeah, the Death Road Records releases. I'm just going to interrupt you because I don't think you'd be able to say it. Don <laughs> Caluminati. There you go. Very good. When I see that word, I, I have, my brain immediately separates it into two well, words. Captain Conspiracy is here today, my friend. Yeah, the, the seven day theory, uh, which reportedly features lyrics predicting Tupac's death. Mm -hmm. uh, it is alleged that Tupac developed a dislike for the Illuminati, uh, the the power the organi organization supposedly yields while in prison in 1995. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, this has been brought up time and time again that this that th these very important shadowy figures with lots of power 
took this guy out because he was outspoken and he was going to speak out against such people. Well, and one of the things that uh, the, kind of the theory behind the Illuminati, as far as it goes with the, the rap world or the music world, is the idea that we'll, you know, we need to dumb down America. We need to dumb down the world. And if we can dumb them down, then we can kind of do whatever we want. And they're just not going to be focused on that. Mm -hmm. So you need rappers to be talking about bitches and hoes, right? You need uh, some dumb music out there. You don't need to have people saying socially relevant stuff. Mm -hmm. and Well, you don't want to get the people thinking too much, right? Or asking too many questions. Right. And so a lot of the stuff that Tupac and one of the things that drew me and, you know, it wasn't like I was this kid listening to Tupac. It was afterwards and the, the studying of him. And, the, and then I was really interested when um, some of my college professor friends were saying, oh, they're teaching classes on him now. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, why? And you start diving into his interviews and what he is saying about, you know, you, you know, you need to empower yourself. You know, you need to get education and it doesn't have to be through a four years in college, but you need to educate yourself. And he was, he was saying things like this. So the kind of this theory is, yeah, Tupac had some of these, you know, you know, quote unquote gangster rap type songs, but he was also saying stuff of empowerment. Mm -hmm. And, and so the idea would be that they would want to get rid of him because he was trying to uplift and if you really dive into what he was talking about with the thug life stuff, which I never knew much about that. I just thought it was just kind of some silly thing he'd say, thug life. But it's really this mantra and these ways. And he was actually writing up laws and and things that people could follow. And if you f follow this thug life, it wasn't really to be a thug at all. It was to uplift yourself, educate yourself, get yourself out of this situation. Mm -hmm. And one could argue this is kind of you know possibly from tupac's upbringing i mean his mother was a black panther and a lot of the stuff that the black panther party stood for actually was you know th there was some socially relevant stuff there as well so i think some of that education came down from his mother well and i think a lot of these thoughts too that that tupac was putting out and that some of the thoughts that the black panther party has put out over the years is that you know, united, we are much better than we are as individuals. And who would that scare? Well, that would scare the people in power, the people that might trying to be, quote unquote, control us. You know, it's almost it's very reminiscent of when we discussed uh, Joseph Colombo, the, the, the guy that was uniting Italian-Americans. Right. And the thought that he was probably that he could have been killed by people or organizations of power because he was uniting people and he was he was getting people to believe in themselves, believe in their community and believe in their brothers and sisters around them to to stand up for themselves and stand up for their communities and and to have a voice. Well, and the other thing that uh, Tupac talks about a lot is, you know, gangster rap was talking about the real the real struggles that were happening on the streets and the deaths that were happening on the streets. And therefore, since they were bringing it to light, there were some statistics that were done. And he always talked about how the, the powers of be want to shut that down. And the government for a lot of times, like uh, Tipper Gore was like a spearheaded, you know, let's just, let's not allow this music to come out. Mm -hmm. And one of the Tupac's ideas was you don't want us to talk about this. So, so the problem goes away. But the problem's not going to go away. You, you know, people are just not going to report on it anymore. There's still going to be people killing each other, but you're not going to care because it's never reported to you. Mm -hmm. Well, and we should mention the FBI thing here because I, I don't necessarily know that it fits 100%, but it but it's, in itself, I don't know that it's a separate theory. So let's just cover that now while we're on this topic because, you know, the thought is that Potentially the government or the FBI killed somebody like Tupac because of reasons we just stated. But the evidence to that would be that there is uh, there's some proof out there that he might have been being watched by certain agencies. Yeah, and he definitely was. And he might have even being been watched while he was in Las Vegas. Yeah. OK, so he was a OK, here's a couple things. So one, he was a outspoken black male. So with power too. I mean, the bigger his albums got, the more power he actually had. And I think they knew that just as much as the CIA had, uh, you know, has files on, you know, Maynard Keaton, right? Mm -hmm. 
uh, James Maynard Keenan from Tool. They have uh, files on John Lennon. I th- I th- and I think it's naive to think that they shouldn't have those, right? Right. So, you know, we were kind of joking off off air that there's a good possibility that the CIA has files on us. I mean, they're the most boring files they have, but they might have files on us. They have compromising photos of me. <laughs> from, <laughs> from a wet t-shirt contest. Um, but yeah, so did they have files on him? Yes. And if you, if you look at these documentaries of Tupac, sometimes you'll see these surveillance footage and it'll say FBI surveillance footage. Here's where it's not so clear is, is was that surveillance footage from the club that the FBI attained mm-hmm. or was it the actual FBI doing the surveillance? Right. And that's not clear. So we have the Illuminati theory. We have the possibility of FBI or CIA involvement. Um, the way that I look at this thing, Captain, is I wanted to kind of, you know, for if anybody's panicking, I wanted to kind of start with the theories that were a little more outside of the box and mm-hmm. kind of work our way closer to the box if we could. So th- we'll eventually get to our opinions on these theories. Yeah. So, so the next theory of the, of who killed Tupac would be that nobody killed Tupac. Right. That that he is uh, that he's alive and well and possibly living in Cuba. You know, we yeah. we talked about his his aunt being there. Um, uh, there is an article that was published, um, that, that says that he's been in hiding the whole time. There's probably several of those articles. Um, but we've also seen all kinds of pictures of him supposedly that he could be living anywhere, uh, possibly Tupac lookalikes or supposedly mm-hmm. Tupac himself. Yeah. There's a lot of talk too that. He kind of knew this was going to happen. He fell in love with, uh, Machiavelli. Mm-hmm. And Machiavelli was uh, was a guy that faked his own death. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I believe that Machiavelli actually faked his own death and then came back. Uh, I'm not really. F- I I'm not schooled on that very well. Um, I I thought he was somebody that talked of some kind of strategy about faking one's own death. Right. No, I actually believe he actually did. So okay. th- so the fact that he talks a lot about this and and actually actually talked about being rebirthed. Uh, Tupac talked about being rebirth and actually being Machiavelli now. Um, I think because of a lot of that talk, uh, look, when you're shot five times and you kind of see the writing on the wall, mm-hmm. was he a you know, fortune teller? I don't think so. I think he knew that the, the people he was surrounding himself with and the, the entertainment uh, industry that he was in he knew that if he wasn't making changes, he'd probably end up dead. Well, and he's not, he's not an idiot. I mean, the Tupac's a very intelligent man and he, he knows that he, he might be in a bad situation. You right. know, if this happened once it could happen again and I barely escaped the first time, you know, it's very likely. Well, and then there's all these weird talks about the autopsy because you have the autopsy photo. The, the problem with that. I, I, are those real photos or not? So a lot of people will say, well, this is Photoshopped or it's a fake photo. Maybe it is a fake photo. Mm -hmm. And so then that destroys the whole argument about the autopsy photos. Um, now I, but but then he got cremated. So -hmm. he got cremated really quickly. Yeah. So the reports are that it, that he was cremated the next day. Now that's, they're kind of loosey goosey reports because some people will say as late as 24 hours after he passed away right. or as early as 10 to 12 hours after he passed away. Yeah. And that's pretty suspicious. But then we also have the death certificate. Yeah. So I was trying to find an autopsy because there's been arguments that there was one conducted, that there is no autopsy. I got nowhere with that. The best I could do was uh, locate a death certificate. Now, well, and let's, let me be clear about the autopsy. There might not be one, and I'm not, I'm not a doctor. You know, I'm a captain. But the th- the thing is here is that we know that he had a punctured lung, mm-hmm. or something was wrong with his lung because of the gunshot. He was shot in the lung, yeah. And they had to pull. I, I believe they had to remove um, the lung. So I think maybe there wasn't an autopsy because they were already doing all these surgeries. So they already know. Mm. So it's not like a, you know, we showed up to this house and Tupac was murdered. It was, he was in the hospital for multiple days. Yeah. 
But on the death certificate itself, um, the two things that stand out there are that the height and weight listed on the death, let's be clear, the one that I saw, right? they're not accurate. They The death certificate that I saw has him listed as six foot tall, 215 pounds. Well, okay, that's, right. Tupac was nowhere near six no. foot tall. He was nowhere near 215 pounds. He was pounds. about five, eight, five, nine. It was about 160 to 170 pounds. Yeah, and I would say if he's 170 pounds, that's soaking wet with 10 rolls of quarters in his pocket because well, I, he was a very lean uh, a very lean guy. Yeah, and I think if you look at the, like I said, Google image search Tupac Shakur, the, the, the night of the fight, he actually looks thinner than normal. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and the thing with the death certificate is is two things. Okay, so first of all, I reviewed the whole thing. There's nothing else on that document that I called into question. It was only the height and weight that appeared to be wrong to me. They even had his his birth name on there. They had, you know, that his mother had signed off on it. The problem is I'm seeing it on a computer in the garage. Right. It's not a, an official document by the state of Nevada that was handed to me. It, it, it's it's something that somebody could have very easily doctored and put on the internet. Yeah. Okay. So I'm just going to give my opinion on this if he's actually dead. Now, a couple things. Uh, a lot of conspiracy theorists will say that when his mother gives interviews, maybe she smirks or something like this. She gave plenty of interviews claiming that he died. I mean, and explaining to you, oh, by the way, I'm the one that had to let it go. You know, and I had to say, "Hey, let's let's stop this." He he doesn't want to be a prison. Uh, he doesn't want to be a prisoner here, anyways. He's he's not happy with what's going on, anyways, and he's now struggling. You know, let let him let his soul move on. Mm-hmm. And so I'm just going to go with the fact that that's what she has stated over and over and over. And why wouldn't I want to believe a mother? I understand that the idea of the conspiracy theorist of him faking his own death would be, well, yeah, his mom would cover up for him. Mm-hmm. And I, yeah, I think that, uh, unfortunately it would be great if he was still alive and, but, but I think it's a very unlikely theory. Um, the other, the next one would be the Jewish. Well, let me just, okay. So, so we can put a bow on this, right? Mm-hmm. There are maybe two, because look, a lot of like, anybody that's into conspiracy will be like, you, you guys missed this or you missed that. Well, yeah, I understand that there's some videos that were made in Cuba uh, of a rapper and possibly Tupac's in the background for point zero zero two seconds. Uh, I don't know what to make of that. You know, kind of looks like him. All I can say on that theory is there's there's. Two things that have have me um, that are hard for me to wrap my head around. One, the amount of eyewitness accounts in Haiti that have come forward to uh, um, authorities saying that they saw Tupac. It's like a crazy amount, like ten thousand reports. Mm-hmm. The other one is there's like two photos out there. If you Google search Tupac's alive, you can search through and and take a gander yourself. But there's two. Um, in my eyes that I have a hard time explaining. So that's all I'm going to put out there. But do I believe he's dead? I do believe he's, he's dead. The third theory would be the Jewish Defense League. Uh, the FBI reportedly discovered threats to Tupac as well as rapper Easy e from the far-right pro-Israel political religious group, the Jewish Defense League, the JDL. Uh, it is alleged that the JDL made anonymous death threats against Tupac and then offered him protection services for and trade for large sums of money. When this money wasn't paid, it is alleged that the JDL murdered Tupac. Um, but the, the, the FBI has, has discovered these threats and has stated this, but they also state that there is no link between the JDL and the killing of Tupac that has ever been discovered by them. Well, if there's a conspiracy on a death that you want to look into, uh, something that's pretty fascinating, easy, that'd be one. Mm-hmm. As far as a conspiracy, that's one that I've looked into. I can't explain it myself. The next theory would be Suge Knight. 
that mm-hmm. th- that Suge Knight had had Tupac killed, that it was some kind of hit, some kind of conspiracy against a guy in his own organization. Um, this is a theory that I really dove a lot into because going into it, I, I thought that this was a pretty likely theory. Mm-hmm. You know, when I was, uh, when I was younger, uh, I, I really did think that probably either, you know, somebody from the East coast group had Pac killed or that, or that Suge Knight did it. So this is one that I dove into quite a bit. The, the, the theory goes like this, that uh, supposedly, um, Suge Knight owed Tupac about $3 million. Possibly a lot more. Yeah. And he also might have known that Tupac was looking to leave death row records, Mm -hmm. uh, in order to start his own label. So the theory runs that if Tupac was killed, death row records would profit from any unreleased material, which we know he had a ton of it because the albums kept coming out. Mm -hmm. Um, death row records have released a number of his albums since his death. Well, right. And then his mother comes out and does a report stating, Hey, when, when we're talking about that BMW earlier, and Mm -hmm. I said it was probably least, the reason why I was stating that is if you look at the the report that the mom came out with, she said, look, my, my son died broke. Right. And when my son would get angry um, at Death Row Records and started saying, where's my damn money? They would drop off a of Bentley. Mm-hmm. And so Tupac would be like, okay, well, I got a Bentley. Oh, he, Tupac's mad again? Drop off another car. All Tupac's mad again? Drop something off. Tupac thought he owned those cars. Right. He would tell everybody that he owns those cars. After his death, it they figured out that all those cars that Death Row Records were saying that they're giving him, they were just leased vehicles. Mm-hmm. And that Death Row Records owed him a bunch of money. But three days before he died, his lawyer sent stuff to Death Row Records lawyer stating basically, like, this is done. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's why when we were talking about the little meeting that Suge and Tupac had, it could have been Tupac and, and Suge Knight talking about this. Mm-hmm. Like, hey, this is how it's going to go down. Now, I don't think Suge is a dumb guy. Uh, I don't think he's a bright guy either. But he's smart enough to know how to threaten people. He did it with Dr. Dre when he wanted to leave. And I think if Tupac wanted to leave, maybe he would let him leave. But he's going to get a percentage of that afterwards. Mm-hmm. Well, the thing here with Knight... Um you know, for those of you not familiar, this is a guy that's no, he's no stranger to being in trouble with the law and he's no stranger to probably acts of violence himself. Um, in 2015, Knight was involved in a hit and run incident that left one man dead and another hospitalized. Uh, now he did turn himself into the sheriff's department for that, uh, the following morning. Um, and at that time was arrested on suspicion of murder. You're right. But if you're going to have a hit on a guy, don't do it when he's in the car with you. Don't do it while you're driving. It doesn't, that doesn't make a lot of sense to me. Well, the, the incident that I was talking about with the, uh, the hit and run incident, mm-hmm. it looks like he is still facing those, his court date, uh, due to some health complications or health problems he's been having, the the court date keeps getting pushed back. Well, he pa- he passed out when they set bail. Mm-hmm. Uh, he passed out in the courtroom. Yeah, and at times he's claimed to have been suffering from blindness um, and some other ailments as well. But it sounds like that case, the the judge has said we're taking this thing to court in January of 2018, and there's health concerns, no health concerns. That's going to be the start of the trial for those charges. Now, another thing here that gets brought up and you're exactly right, captain, there's no way that in my opinion, that he would put himself in the vehicle that's going to get sprayed with bullets. I mean, the vehicle, Mm -hmm. 14 shots is what's most commonly reported. The other thing is that a lot of reports state that, you know what, that incident with Orlando Anderson in the lobby was an incident that Suge Knight created in advance because it would give him some kind of out. It would give police some kind of suspicion that Orlando Anderson and maybe his people were involved. (laughs) And this would pull the guilt or not the guilt, but this would pull a lot of the suspicion off of Suge Knight. The problem with that theory is 
Well, Suge Knight joined in the fight. The dude was on probation, and this was a violation of his probation. He ended up having to go back and spend some time in prison because of the 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 situation that was caught on the surveillance camera that night. Right. So, okay. Right. So then the other things that are against him is that Tupac was probably leaving. So if he's leaving, then again, he'd still probably get some percentage. He's still going to make money off of his old albums. If Tupac became bigger, look, Tupac was probably one of the biggest icons in the world at the time. If he became even bigger than that, Death Row Records is still going to make a bunch of money off of him mm-hmm. from his from his past records. So, and maybe unreleased stuff and, and things like that. So, uh, you know, and also Suge Knight doesn't ever come forward and says who he thinks did it. He always, it's like he changes his story all the time. Oh, well, yeah, Tupac's alive. No, Tupac's dead. Tupac's alive. Oh, no, I saw him in Cuba. It's almost like he's just messing with people. Um, the, the the thing he said on record, and when I say on record, I mean in a videotaped interview that aired a lot of different places. But one thing he said on record that really kind of upset me was that, you know, the thought is that the FBI stating that or the, the police stating that they believe that some of Tupac's associates know who killed him. Right. And so the question was, if you knew, Shug, if you knew who killed Pac, would you report that? Would you t- turn the people in, please? Mm-hmm. And his answer is, no, I wouldn't. I wouldn't say a thing because it's not my job to do that. Right, right. It's I don't get paid to solve crimes. Um, right. Well, but the, right. You run a record label. And that was your artist. It's your job to protect the artist. But you weren't really a, a businessman or a record label. You're just a thug. That's what he was. Right. Right. And, so and, and this was your friend. This was your this was your friend. And if he wasn't, he should have been your friend. Right. And, and and the thing is you can't it is his job. It's his job on some level, and you can argue it a hundred different ways and you'd be right. Right. And I, like I said, I understand that I come from a different uh, background and upbringing, but this whole idea that this uh, snitches get stitches, whole thing, it doesn't make a lot of sense to me. And 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 what also, a couple things. One, I think that goes with the idea that t- that Tupac is actually dead, and what goes with the the thing that uh, a Suge Knight was not involved was the amount of gang riots and murders after Tupac's death. The next couple weeks, they had a big issue with this. The next suspect on the list is Orlando Anderson himself. You know, following the boxing match between... Well, the next theory. The next theory, thank you. Following the boxing match, he was the guy that was attacked uh, when the fight broke out in the in the lobby. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and some stating that this was a fight between rival gangs, the Bloods and the Crips. Um, stating that, you know, Orlando Anderson wanted some form of revenge. You know, that, that he got into a scuffle and he got his butt whooped and, you know, stating, well, what are you going to do now? Well, you're going to go, you're going to go get your friends. Well, he got jumped by yeah. a bunch of people. You're going to go get your friends and you're going to go out and you're going to correct this situation. Right. Um, I'm not going to lie. I like this theory um, because, uh, unfortunately, a lot of times when these things go down in the way that they did, Usually it's a, a result of some form of retaliation. Somebody felt that they were done wrong. Somebody felt that they were embarrassed or beat up or robbed or whatever. Mm-hmm. And they go back out and they take some kind of vigilante justice. Well, and there's some weight to this because there was an, I at least believe one eyewitness that stated that the shooter was Orlando the night of the shooting. Mm-hmm. Well, and th- there was some lawsuits involved as well, right? So we have Anderson who sues Death Row Records because he's attacked a- in Las Vegas. Mm-hmm. And and what happens in response to that lawsuit? Well, there's a wrongful death lawsuit against Anderson for the death of Tupac Shakur, correct? Yeah, yeah. the mother, uh, Afini uh, Shakur, filed one against Anderson four days later. Now, what, what came of that, supposedly is that uh, Death Row Records actually settled and that he uh, Orlando would have netted 78000 Uh He also reported to some magazine Orlando did in 1997 saying, well, I was a fan of Tupac. I was a fan of his music. Mm-hmm. But again, the night of the shooting, you have uh, eyewitness calling, I believe, 911 or the police department saying, hey, I know who shot him. It was this guy. 
Uh, now, who did that call come from? Could it have just been somebody that was in the scuffle and just had a thought that, well, it must have been this guy? Yeah, and but the thing here is we have half the equation when it comes to Orlando, right? We have him in the area, and we have a motive. Um, that's that's more than we have for some of the other people or theories on our list. Now, uh, Orlando was eventually killed in an unrelated gang shooting in 1998. Uh, he and associate were involved in a shootout with uh, some gang members. Several people died in that situation. His associate was later charged uh, for his involvement in the shootout. Yeah, and there's also some other. I can't, I can't find it right now, and I don't think you found it in your research. But something to do with Orlando was already being charged, or was already a suspect in another shooting earlier that year. Yeah, he he was definitely questioned in the shootout regarding Tupac. Uh, he was questioned several times, uh, but whatever took place during that questioning period didn't lead to any arrest. Well, and then we, now we go to uh powder puff daddy. Now, nah, and look, I'm just making a joke. The, you know, Puffy had a couple good tunes, right? He had uh Yeah, but I, here, I can All I, about the Benjamins, baby. Can I go on the record and I'm not doing this to back you up. I just want to throw my own opinion. Mm -hmm. Him him talk the uh-huh, yeah, uh-huh, yeah. Uh -huh. That that is annoying on the songs. He had a couple of his own songs that were decent. He He's like the captain of Bad Boy. <laughs> he keeps interrupting. Uh -huh. Yeah. Uh he sh he should have stuck to doing his own stuff and when he was producing just just produce, man. Uh -huh. Just produce. Yeah. Uh the thing is uh, he's a bad dancer, but he's one hell of a dresser. I'll give him that. Uh huh. Yeah. So anyway, of course we have the the rap war, right? Theory. Uh, mm -hmm. Sean Combs, Biggie. Um, how how do you want to go about this? Because people, you could easily lump these two together, or you could separate them. And when you say lump these two together, you're talking about the Orlando theory and the sean puffy combs theory well well kind well i was going to get to that but what i meant was when you talk about biggie or talk about sean combs do you want to lump them together as one suspect or talk about them separately uh just lump them together i guess okay because i, I don't think look i i think a lot of these you know it takes a special type of person to want to create content to want to rap to want to create music to, for, you know, to write a book or whatever. Right. Mm -hmm. And I think some of these guys, not saying that, you know, you know, Puffy didn't want to create cause he, he produced some stuff, but people like Suge Knight, they weren't creating, they were just, you know, one of the things in interviews that bring up all the time with Tupac is, well, you're getting pimped. That's what they say to him. You're being pimped by the record industry, you know, mm -hmm. or these record label guys. So I don't think, I mean, yeah, you might grow up and there's might be some violent tendencies in how you grow up. But I think both these individuals, even though they had, you know, Biggie and Tupac, even though they had some of violent things, I think a lot of that was more because of the people around them. And well, and I think with Biggie, a lot of it was a bit of show. Um, yeah. You know, I think that he was a hardcore rapper. I don't know that he was a hardcore dude. Um, I didn't, I never really got that sense from him. Uh, but the thing here is captain, you know, when we get into this, when, when, when it first comes out, it's, it's brought up that, that notorious B I G basically put out a hit on Tupac. Right. Um, the, the thing that we're going to get to here, when you dive down into it, it's actually, it's more mentioned that it came from Sean Combs and that, that Biggie actually had nothing to do with this incident. Now, right. what we're talking about here is former LAPD cop Greg Kading. Uh, he says that he was involved in a special task force investigating uh, these different cases. Yeah, he started with the Biggie murder, though. Which led him to, to the Tupac investigation on his own. Mm -hmm. And he claimed in a 2016 documentary that Sean Combs had paid gang members, uh, Crip gang members, Dwayne Keith Davis, uh, one hundred. I'm sorry, one million dollars to carry out the murder. Yeah, well, and it's kind of weird because it's blurry. the 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 rumor was that that he it wasn't that he just gave him a hundred or gave him one million dollars. It was just if this happens, I will pay you. Right. 
Right. And that was my going to be my question to you because when I dove into this thing, it was confusing to me. Was this an outright hit or was it a bounty? Because there's they're two completely different things. Right. A hit you pay someone, here's here's your this is our agreement, go kill the person. Right. A bounty is more like job of the hut that's like, you know what, if somebody brings me this guy, there's a reward. So uh, it sounds to me more like a bounty. Uh the this guy his his name that he goes by is uh, Keefy D, uh, so we'll call him Keefy D. But he lived he lived or was from the Los Angeles area. <laughs> Wait, hold right? on. He goes by Keefy D, so we're going to call him Keefy D. Well, it's easier than saying Dwayne <laughs> Keith Davis right, right, every right, time. Right, right. So this guy he lives around. From my understanding, lived around the Los Angeles area. Yeah. Um, well, if if he if you were going to put a bounty out on somebody and he's from the the Crip. He's a Crip member, uh, and you wanted Tupac dead. Well, Tupac would have been in that area. This seems like a likely thing here. Um, but the way that this story goes is a little different. It's not taking place in Los Angeles. It's taking place in Las Vegas. Right. Why? Because Keith, happenstance, though. Keefe D happens to be in Las Vegas. He claims that he and a bunch of friends, a bunch of associates, were going to be in Vegas for the fight that weekend. Right. The situation is this. Who is Keefe D? Well, he is the uncle of Orlando Anderson. Mm-hmm. Well, Orlando Anderson is attacked by Tupac that evening. Right. And so after that attack goes down, Orlando, Keefe D, and all these guys are sitting around talking about this. You know, well, how are we going to correct this situation? Because we just we just look like we got punked. Now we're going we're gonna to correct this situation here. Oh, wait a second. In there that uh in there that bounty out there, in there this situation out there that somebody could make a whole lot of money. Right. And we might be going after this guy anyway for our own reasons tonight. So why right. don't we it just makes a bunch of sense. Yeah. Why don't we just do both at once? Mm-hmm. So the way that I understand the situation, now these are Keefe D's words. This is his You can listen to his he, there's an actual audio confession. Yeah. And he's confessing that him along with what it's, it's seven guys. It's eight guys total in the beginning. Right. So they have their crew of people. Now the, one of the interesting things was people said, well, or Orlando Anderson had no ticket to the fight. So why was he at the fight? A lot of people call him a pawn, you know, like, well, we'll set him up for the conspiracy theory. Well, the reason why he's at the fight is because some of his crew was at the fight. They had tickets, yeah. but he didn't have a ticket. So, hey, you guys go to the fight. I'm just going to stay out here in the lobby. When he gets caught in the lobby with um, Death Row Records, that's when the fight breaks out. So then while they're there and uh, Keefe D's um, um, buddy or whatever says, hey, you can take care of that hit now. Like, kill two birds with one stone, right? Right. And, well, we don't have any guns. The guy goes, here's my gun. Gives him the gun. They pull up on Pac. Want me to keep going? Well, yeah. Uh, the guy's name that he goes by, the guy that supplied the gun, he goes by the name Zip. Right. So Zip gives him the gun. Uh, what were they renting that weekend? He, one of the guys, his mother, had rented the late model white Cadillac. So mm-hmm. they had access to a vehicle matching the description. They right. have access to a firearm. So what they do is they pull up. They're in the right-hand lane. Uh, oh, actually... So what happens is what Keefe D says. He says that they go to the 662 Club mm-hmm. and they decide, okay, well, we're going to drink a little liquor. We're going to smoke a little weed. We're going to go to the 662 Club and that's where Tupac's supposed to be. It sounds to me like they were trying to ambush Tupac and Suge Knight in the parking lot of the 662 Club. Right. So they pull up and they have two vehicles. There's four guys in each vehicle. They sit there for about 20 minutes or so, and during the course of this time, when Tupac and Suge Knight are not showing up, some of the guys start to get cold feet, and they start Mm -hmm. to worry about what, you know, the situation just got real. You know, you can sit behind closed doors and say you're going to take down these people, but once you're in the car and you get to the location- (laughs) once you're at the parking lot. Oh, man, I would have ran out of there faster than- (laughs) Straight pooped yourself, you know? (laughs) But I'll tell you what- Oh, excuse me. So some of the guys start to get cold feet. Keefe mm-hmm. D is in one vehicle. He's not in the Cadillac at this point. And he tells the other guys, you know what? Go off, do whatever you want. I'm going to hop in this other car. He hops yeah. in the Cadillac. So now in the Cadillac, we have the driver. He goes by the name T Brown. 
Uh, mm-hmm. We have Keefe D riding shotgun. Mm-hmm. Behind the driver, we have DeAndre. Uh, he goes by Dre. he goes by Dre. Mm-hmm. And the behind Keefe D in the in the back passenger right hand side is uh, Orlando. Is Orlando. And so they decide that they're going to go. I guess they're going to go look for Pac and yeah, look I for think, Shug. Well, I think the idea was more like, well, let's go get some more booze. Maybe we'll get some more weed, possibly. And then work our way back. To and the then club. we'll work our way back. And so as they're going up and down the strip, they're like, well, maybe we'll run into them there. Well, as they pull up to this intersection, there's these girls screaming, Pac, Pac, right? Mm-hmm. Now, there's four girls in a grease, green Sebring, and they're, um, they're interviewed often. So they're the ones that drew the attention to to the QBD. the location of Pac. Right. So now they're like, well, there he is. So Keefe D turns around and hands the gun to Dre because Dre would be in the back passenger side. And Keefe D is like, well, I'm not going to shoot him. Y- yeah, because Keefe D was, was the one claiming he would shoot at the vehicle, that he would shoot Suge and he would shoot Tupac. Mm -hmm. But their original, you know, when they see the vehicle, their first thought is, well, get up on the left-hand side so Keefe D in the passenger seat can reach out the window and 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 spray the car. Right, right. But they couldn't because if you look at the positioning of the cars in the intersection, they couldn't get to the left side of their car. So they're forced to pull up on the right-hand side. Now, Keefe D sitting in the front seat, he does not want to reach over the driver and And, and shoot and blast in front of the face of his driver. So as the captain says... He tries to hand the gun to Dre, who's sitting directly behind the driver. Right. Dre says, you know what? I don't want anything to do with this. Get that thing away from me. Mm-hmm. It's then that we have Orlando, who was attacked earlier that evening. He decides to take the gun. He grabs the gun from Keefe D. He reaches over Dre, and he puts his hand just outside of the window, and he shoots the car as many times as he can. Right. And then they drive off. This is what Keefe D says. So then they drive off. They turn right on the intersection. And then all of a sudden they realize that a car is following them. Now what Keefe D says is, well, we thought it was a girl and the the girls chasing after us. Mm-hmm. But he claims that there was some gunshots. So then they fire back. And as we know, uh, based off of the uh, statements that. Um, From Frank Alexander, the bodyguard. The bodyguard and the other outlaws, they claim that they chased after this white Cadillac. Mm-hmm. So again, he now this is not heavily reported that there was other shots after the sh- the first shootings with Tupac. So the fact that Keefe D actually states this to me has more validity with his story. Right, right. And, uh, and, and it also explains why the, uh, the members from Death Row decide to stop pursuing the vehicle. Yeah. And then what Keefe D claims is that, see, now he grew up with Suge Knight. And what he claims is that when Orlando was shooting at the car, that Suge Knight made eye contact with Keefe D, and he knew uh, that Keefe D and his crew were responsible for the death of Tupac. Yeah, and he also states that he thought that Suge Knight would die that night because he thought he was hit in the head with a bullet. Right, so then after they get away from uh, the other vehicle, the bodyguards, then what happens? Well, the the guys, they park their white Cadillac, and they actually park it, it it's strange because they park it somewhere that's very close to where Suge Knight's car ends up at the at the end of the night. Uh, they park their vehicle, and they put the gun the way I understand it, they put the gun on top of the tire uh, to right. kind of hide it for the evening. They go off and party for the night, and then the following day, they go back to the vehicle. They check the vehicle, make sure that there's no loose shell casings inside the vehicle. Well, they're very lucky that the cops didn't find that vehicle mm-hmm. because all they would have to do, I think, uh, even with it being on the wheel well, I, I don't think they would need a search warrant for that. Well, they, of course they wouldn't need a, a search warrant for that. I think part of that is why they left the gun outside of the vehicle, because if there was nothing inside proving that that gun was inside the vehicle, then they could claim that somebody else just put that gun there. Right. The problem is then they would have to explain why they have rented a vehicle that matches the description of the car that was supposedly shot at Tupac. Uh, and why that that rental car could be traced back to one of those 
those men in the vehicle. All right. So let's try to put a bow on this theory, right? Mm -hmm. Now, this theory, I think, holds a lot of weight to me. And a lot of people would say, well, this guy is, you know, Keefe D was just a criminal anyways. And he gave this confession, I believe, when he was in jail. But where is the proof? Well, here's here's a couple things. Out of the four people in the car, that we we have proof that three of them were in Vegas. Now, one of them claims they weren't in Vegas, but I think two of those guys then claim that guy was actually in Vegas with them. Yeah, my understanding is that it's the driver of the vehicle says that he was not in Vegas that weekend. And as you just mentioned, the only other two guys that are still alive that were in that vehicle that night say he was the driver of the Cadillac. Well, right, and... We also have the surveillance footage. I don't know if it's FBI surveillance footage or not, but to me, you can see a white Cadillac on the footage. Of the parking lot at 662. Yeah, whether or not you can see Keefe D, I swear at some point I saw footage that I could see him on it, but uh, I, I can't I can't find it to, to show you. And I think that there's probably no question that, that we favor this theory better than the others that we presented. That's part of the reason why we saved it for last. That's part of the reason why you hear us jumping out of our chairs to talk about it. Right. The thing here for me is because it all kind of lines up. Uh, there, there, there are some questions that I have and I'll get to those in a minute, but the thing here is, okay, we have people that put themselves in the area. Mm -hmm. Uh, they have the means, they say that they had access to a gun they were driving a vehicle that matches the description given by everybody. There's no question about the description of the vehicle. Mm -hmm. And we also have a motive. We have an obvious motive. And not only do we have an obvious motive, but to me, I see all kinds of motives when you claim that these guys are the ones that carried out the murder. And it looks to me as though they, in their intention was to shoot Suge and Tupac was to kill both of them is what it appears to me. Because as he states that they would have preferred to have pulled up on the left side of the vehicle and fired into the vehicle in that manner. Now, we could have seen a different result with that. We could have seen a, a Suge Knight get killed and a Tupac survive the attack had it mm -hmm. gone down that way. But again, it, it, their motives... Uh, retaliation. One well, also to, and also Tupac's mom then files a wrongful death against this guy as well. We have the retaliation thought for the motivation. We also have just the gang aspect, uh, right. for the motivation. And then the, the icing on the cake for their motivation would be that they could stand to make a whole lot of money. If in fact that this bounty that was supposedly put out by Sean Combs, if it was in fact a real thing. Mm -hmm. The problem, the only problem I see with the confession itself is the involvement of Sean Combs. I, I, it, that to me, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't make the connection. Right. Uh, I understand that it's probably, you know, it was a general suspicion by people at the time. Um, I think it makes for a better story for well, Keefe D. It, it also could have just been a rumor that Keefe D heard. Mm -hmm. It might not have actually been something that came from Tupac's, or not Tupac, uh, from Puffy's mouth, right? Right, right. And I think if there were a large amount of money, and I know Puffy's somebody that has the ability to deal in large amounts of money, but if seeing a movement of that amount of money Exchange hands. Yeah, FBI or CIA would have, would have yeah. set off some big red flags here. So where where I stand, in my opinion, is that this this theory makes the most sense. Well, and, and on top of that, LAPD when they were doing the investigation, a lot of detectives that have done work on this investigation all think that the murders came from somebody from the South Side uh, Crips. Mm -hmm. And these guys were members. And and just to be clear, you didn't misspeak there because you're saying LAPD and this took place in Las Vegas. The thing here is we're seeing information coming out of former LAPD detectives and officers that are saying we started investigating the biggie portion of this of this story. Right. And because this is what happened in our area. We started to see we started to look to see if there were ties between the two murders and it led us to our own personal investigations into Tupac's murder and mm -hmm. this is the theories in in the things that we're seeing come to light now. Well, and on top of that, after the murders, like I said, there were gang violence and shootings for weeks and weeks afterwards as a retaliation. 
Now, why would there be a retaliation if your gang was not involved? Right. It doesn't make any sense. Well, and the thing here is I want to go on record stating this very clearly. I think that this was a, a gang, uh, a gang related murder. The thing here is I want to be very clear. I'm not stating that it was Tupac that was in some kind of rivalry gang. I, I believe this was carried out by a gang, probably with people with gang ties. These guys, this confession from Keefe D, that all falls into that theory. Right. And, and what we talked a lot about when we were researching this case, um, I'm just fascinated by Tupac in general. And I feel like he has... I feel like the weight that he was carrying in his words doesn't get enough respect from people that are outside of the hip hop community. So if you, if you were a hip hop fan or if you're a rap fan, then yes, this, then Tupac was this icon. We ain't telling you something you don't already know. Right. But if you're not in this world and you, that that's not something you're interested in, then you're like, why the heck are they covering this guy? Look, I'm a huge Beatles fan. As much as John Lennon was an icon to this world, so was Tupac Shakur. And I think when you look into the FBI or the CIA or the Illuminati or he's still alive, all these odd theories, it's because at the end of the day, somebody that was so magical of an individual, you know. Uh, influencer. And it, yeah, well, don't say influencer <laughs> because. Now, if you have a, a bunch of people following you on Instagram, they call you an influencer. I want to say this, and maybe I'll get some heat from it, and I don't give I don't give a shit, okay? This guy was possibly some form of a prophet, right? I think that same thought about John Lennon. I think that same thought about Muhammad Ali. I think that same thought about Malcolm X. I think that same thought about Martin Luther King. This guy was saying things that were relevant, and he didn't have to. He was a multimillionaire and he wasn't getting paid at what he should have. Right. His labels holding this money that he was not getting paid what he should have, but he, he had all this money. He had all this power. He didn't have to say this stuff. He could have just kept to himself, you know, stayed in his own lane, eyes on the prize, been greedy, uh, be selfish. I think because of his upbringing, his intelligence, the way he saw the world, he would even say in interviews, my brain sees things different than most. And I believe, and if you look at uh, somebody that I think is a, a, a musical genius, Quincy Jones, Quincy Jones, his daughter was, was uh, dating him. And he said, when you met Tupac, this guy was on a different level as if he was touched by the hands of God or something. That's his state. That's what he is saying. So I think all these other theories that he's still alive or maybe the CIA killed him or the government, I think because at the end of the day, this guy was so special and so magical that you don't want to believe some, you know, and let's say what Orlando was, he was a thug, but he was also a young, naive thug. And for whatever reason, uh, you don't want to believe that this guy could take out somebody so powerful and so magical. I won't use the word profit. I think all those guys were great men. I think the loss here is that, in my opinion, Tupac had the potential to grow into becoming a great man. Right. I think that he was incredibly talented, incredibly smart. I think I see a very impulsive young man uh, making some poor decisions. Yeah, um, obviously, yeah. What what I'm getting at, though, is I think that if he could have stayed out of trouble, which would have been very likely if he could have removed himself from some of those bad elements that had worked their way into his life, mm -hmm. that I think he could have grown into being... He was already something special, but he could have grown into being something very positive uh, for himself and for everybody, for all of us. Because I would have loved to have seen a Tupac in his 30s. I would have loved to have seen a Tupac in his forties. Right. Especially, you know, I mean, not even just as a rapper, but as a, as an actor, he was an amazing actor. Yes, he was. And the thing here is I'm, I just think that we didn't get to experience all the things that I know he was capable of. Yeah. And when I say profit, I don't mean like the hands of God. What I mean, it's somebody, I, I believe that there's people that are put on this earth, right? We're all put on this earth somehow. Right. But that some of these individuals have something inside them 
and they can't stop it. And I don't think he could stop himself from trying to help others or trying to present the truth or ways to others. That's what I mean by all that. Well, we might get some more insight into these stories because I, I noticed A and E is doing a big uh, notorious B I G and Tupac mm-hmm. uh, type documentary. We also have Tupac's movie coming out sometime this month. I'm not excited about it. I'm not excited about the movie. I'm excited about the A and E uh, documentaries that are coming out. And what was the what was the title of the thing that we we found the the confession from? In case anybody wants to go look it up for themselves. Yeah, if anybody's interested in looking more into these and also the Big East side, which I, I would like to dive more into the Big East side as well. Um, big fan of his. Uh, it's called Murder Rap, and you can check out that book anywhere, really. Yeah. A- Amazon, maybe. Yeah, it's definitely on Amazon. I was just checking it out myself. Uh, and if you want to go and check out our recommended reading, go to truecrimegarage.com. We'll have that up there for you. And you can purchase anything, uh, any of those recommended books through our Amazon app, if you like. And they give us a little kickback at no charge to you. So you can do that by going to truecrimegarage.com. Click on the Amazon banner. And also don't forget about all of our fantastic sponsors. One of the best sponsors out there is talkspace.com. You got to check these people out because they have made therapy convenient and affordable for everybody. Yeah, today's sponsor was sponsored by Talkspace, the online therapy company that believes therapy should be affordable, confidential, and convenient. A Talkspace therapist can help put you on a path to a happier life. For our special offer to our listeners, visit Talkspace.com slash garage. Again, that's Talkspace.com slash garage. Thanks, everybody, for joining us in the garage. Make sure you check out the website, truecrimegarage.com. Make sure you follow us on social media. If you're not already, you're very late to the game.